So to kind of kick this off a little bit, uh, just prior to starting the record button, um, as you guys might have uh, heard already, we have a more special guest on uh, today's episode, um, but we were discussing backgrounds and I kind of surprised our guests a little bit and I apologize for that when I'm like, hey, can this be on our YouTube channel? And they're like, sure. Uh, and then they express some concern <laughs> over the background and are just like, look at Spencer's background. It is a blanket. So you guys 100 percent professional are, oh, yeah. are yeah. good. <laughs> and and in all fairness, they probably have the most professional background of of anybody's. Mine and mine is our tat my tattered studio here. We are joining you from the worldwide headquarters of the Standard of Care podcast. So dang, you guys have a world. <laughs> wow. I guess mine's technically the worldwide headquarters yeah. too. But yeah. <laughs> you know, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of like saying uh, I'm the best podcast titled EMS 2020 that has ever, yeah, ever been I'm, uh, been. In if if yeah. you're the headquarters, I'm like that, like far off base, remote base in like Antarctica. You know, <laughs> That's like, yeah. yeah, you're you're the remote outpost. Oh, you're still here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just sent you out there to collect penguin dung. <laughs> oh gosh. Uh, well, yeah. I guess uh, I guess we're gonna start the show now. And then this right. is where I. This podcast is hosted by Chris Finkston and Spencer Oliver. They are both experienced paramedics. They've done everything from 911 ground ambulance to volunteer fire department work and are both currently flight paramedics. This podcast reviews scenarios based on real calls run by real out-of-hospital clinicians. Details are changed to protect the privacy of those involved and to present educational opportunities to the listener. This podcast is EMS 2020. We sing it. We, we uh, whenever you guys hear that theme, we are singing it in the background. In your head, it's, yeah, yeah. I figured yeah. you were. I, I thought you were gonna serenade us with some in sync today. Yeah. Well, uh, no. <laughs> Which, my favorite part <laughs> about that. I showed up. Yeah. No, it's, oh, okay. I mean, sure. You'll just have to wait till we're done recording, and then I'll definitely do yeah. it. <laughs> then. 100% it's going to happen. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to another episode of EMS uh, 2020. And uh, once again, we have uh, more voices added to uh, added to the show today. Uh, those voices happen to belong uh, to Samantha Johnson and Nick Adams. And if you recognize those names, then you're a longtime listener and we appreciate you. Uh, but yeah. Samantha Johnson is a lawyer and Nick Adams is a fire chief. And they're the host of the Standard of Care podcast, which... I don't like to pick favorite podcast, but if I did, <laughs> it would be one of my, because I'm a giant nerd and they cover all the legal questions that you would ever have in EMS. And it's, that's always uh, a question everyone has. Oh, everyone always has the, well, what if I write this in my chart kind of questions? Or, well, what yeah. happens if I do this? What's mm -hmm. patient abandonment? All these things. And you guys talk about that frequently on your podcast. And we I want to, I want to talk about two episodes that you guys have really quick, just, just, because I love them. Um, one of them is uh, an episode where you guys talk about the uh, the two paramedics that were charged with murder uh, yes. in, was that Illinois? Was it Illinois? Yes, yes yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, uh, it was Illinois because we did a YouTube thing on it and then you guys did a deep dive on it uh, after that. So if you guys ever watched our RSI channel and you watch that video where we talk about the two paramedics and we, we review some body cam footage, um, yeah. absolutely yeah. Head over to Standard of Care podcast and check out that episode. It's the um, it's the perspective you need to really understand why the charges are happening and what's going on uh, in that call. So check out Standard of Absolutely. Care podcast uh, for that. And then there's one you did recently where there's footage from I think it's like a nearby gas station. I'm not sure. There's oh, yeah. a uh, yeah. Oh, yeah yep yeah the one in Dallas. Yeah, it, I believe it, it, there's a uh, an individual that uh, comes up and you know given I mean this individual probably made some poor choices themselves, but then the choices yeah. made by the responders on scene were beyond poor choices uh it uh, it appeared to uh, to me um we had, we so, have an update on that one oh, where that, um that responder ended up getting fired for his actions we got to see the video to really understand understand it yeah but um he just recently got his job back um really uh, yes he did. so we, we're gonna have to do a follow-up episode huh. to that to that oh, one gosh. well that means everyone listening needs to head on over to the standard care podcast and get caught up because that follow-up will be one that uh, i will certainly be uh, listening to. So yeah, thank you guys. Thank you, Nick and Samantha for uh, joining us today. And uh, if you guys want your call to be reviewed by EMS 2020, because that is what we do. We review real mm -hmm. out of hospital calls. Uh, send uh, 
I've done this once or twice before. Uh, <laughs> I promise. Uh, head on over to our social media. We are EMS20 slash 20 on Facebook and at EMS2020 show on Instagram. On Instagram, you'll find a beacons page linked in our bio. On Facebook, you'll find a pinned post. And in either that beacons page or the pinned post, you will see a link to a form where you can submit your calls. Don't worry. We don't just fire from the hip and use the form. We will contact you and get more information. We uh, go ahead and do a little uh, little interview. And then we, uh, yeah, then maybe your call will be uh, picked apart by uh, us and uh our lawyer friends uh, anyway so uh, <laughs> so yeah so uh check those out uh also check out our youtube channel rapid sequence info we are <clears throat> rapid sequence info it's at rapid sequence info on youtube uh this will be on uh there as well if you want to see our pretty faces um with that gosh anything else spence before we get started uh one thing i want to say real quick is that uh, there's a trigger warning uh, with this oh, call, because yeah. we are going to be talking about a pretty gross situation yeah. uh, dealing with abuse and neglect. And uh, some of the descriptions are graphic. Um, so for, you know, uh, really anyone uh, yeah, just understand, uh, come into this with a little caution. Uh, maybe this is the episode where you don't let your fucking kids listen to it. You know, you right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. dropped the F-bomb. Yeah. 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 Uh, if you are letting your kids listen to EMS 2020, we do mark explicit on there for a reason. So yeah. just just be aware that uh, we may be teaching them more uh, words than public school. So yeah, I, I go to public but school. My kids go to public school. I want to clarify that. <laughs> yeah, um, but probably not. Well, um, with that out of the way, uh, let's get into the call. So this week's call to review was brought to us by an EMT advanced. I'm calling Discovery. Um, okay. Discovery had about a year of experience with an EMT. Uh, excuse me. Discovery had about a year of experience as an EMTA at the time of the call. But prior to that, they had about two and a half years of experience. Uh, they are working with a partner who, uh, who's an EMT with about one year of EMS experience that I'm calling damages. OK, nice. I like where you're going with this. This is really good. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about the system that discovery and damages work in. Uh, the ambulance service is a third service agency called the wheels of just EMS. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry. They don't turn Ow. slow. Uh, yeah, oh, gotcha. boom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's what I'm here for. All right. Oh goodness. And it, and it does help if you keep wheels in mind as I describe the system, uh, cause that's going to be a little helpful later. Um, mm. this is a medium sized service, uh, with roughly 12 ambulances on during a 24 hour period. Just over half of those ambulances are BLS level, which that's defined as a dual EMT or an EMT partnered with an EMT advanced. Um, and the other half or other less than half of those are ambulances are ALS level responders. So that's going to be a paramedic partnered with an EMT or a paramedic partnered with an EMT advanced or um, I, I can't imagine this still happens, but medic medic. Uh, <laughs> wow. Some places I've yeah. heard of it. Yeah. Oh my yeah. goodness! Gosh, that used to—I mean, that used to be the standard. Like when I when I yeah. started, it was like, yeah, every now and again, an EMT would hop on to the junior spot, you know. Wow. Uh, but uh, it used to be yeah. Yeah, all all medic medic. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry. We have discovery and we have damages. Uh, I was looking yep. for a pen, so people. Uh, so this is why you should check out the YouTube channel. You guys get to see me struggle to find a pen that works. <laughs> Uh, on the YouTube channel. What was yes. damages background again? Sorry. Uh, so damages is an EMT with a year of experience. Okay. Gotcha. So Samantha is over here furiously scribbling everything you say down and I'm just enjoying the story. So yeah. yeah. Right. Well, Scott, yeah. That's that's that. It, it helps sure. when you have your lawyer there. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, All right. So let's go back to the wheel uh, because that's going to, that's going to be a, a big part of the, service area for uh the wheels of justice mm. or g just dms service. all right so uh i want you guys to imagine a large wheel okay with a smaller wheel nestled inside of it okay all right the small wheel is a dense urban area that has a level one trauma center and two level three hospitals or trauma center hospitals. Um, and this is that area where the BLS ambulances are utilized for patient transport. OK, uh, part of that is because the transport times are typically about five to ten minutes. Okay. Um, and if ALS is needed, 
there are paramedic supervisors who can respond out to make a BLS ambulance an ALS unit. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. But in the outer wheel, those are all ALS ambulances. Um, And they're out there because uh, there are less hospital options. There's more Mm -hmm. like, oh, hey, this is a critical asset access center Um, or just the hospitals where they're like, oh, you you have more than a stub toe. Okay, we're going to send you up north or up east or west or wherever. We're going to send you into the little wheel. Yeah, (laughs) you're you're going to go into the little wheel. Exactly. Um, You don't have to go home, but you can't stay here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) All right. Um, and those transport times are closer to like 45 minutes. Okay. Um, so this service does use a di- uh, dynamic deployment model. Um, so there are posts out and they are prioritized. Uh, uh, the crews at Wheel of Justice, or, God, woof, just EMS, excuse me. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, I was confused. I did not know what you meant for half yeah. a second. I'm like, what's this new agency? <laughs> That's the police force. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. All right, uh, Chris, you'll be familiar with this. They work 12 and a half hour shifts on sure a 223 schedule. Sure, oh. they do. <laughs> yeah. And per discovery, uh, we know that at least for the BLS crews, they typically run 12 to 14 calls in that time. So okay. busy. Okay. Wow. 12 to 14 calls in a 12 and a half, which we all know is about a 14, 15 hour shift. But wow. Yeah. Yeah. But again, like these are these are pretty short transport times as well. So okay. um, that, you know, um, I, I don't know where we worked. A call was kind of roughly like an hour long, I mm-hmm. think is fair to say here. They're they're more like a half hour, okay. I, I, I would right. imagine, with that short transport time. Yeah. If, so, if, if they're in the little wheel in. the Yeah. In the little yeah, wheel. In the, in, um, in the little wheel. I, okay. Yeah. All right. So in this system, the closest unit to the, a call will get dispatched to a call regardless of the call type, okay. um, although management can override this and sometimes will if like calls start to stack up um, mm-hmm. and they're like, OK, uh, you know what? We're going to send this ALS unit to that call because it seems more like an ALS call right. sort of a thing. Um, EMT advance on BLS cars are authorized to work within their full scope, including IV IO access fluid and IV administrations, as long as it's in their scope. However, there is a rule. Uh, for the service that ALS should be requested to intercept if they go above the EMT uh, scope of practice. Um, And (sighs) Discovery does say, like, it's really gray. Like, you can basically go, uh, hey, I I need ALS, but I don't. Mm -hmm. And or, you know, an ALS will go, "Okay, yeah, it sounds like we're busy and we wouldn't make it there in time to make it really worthwhile. Um, Maybe you just transport five minutes to the hospital. Yeah. yeah. And so. I was just thinking that too. I'm kind of like, yeah, it, it seems like, you know, cause the whole goal sometimes is like, you don't necessarily think of like, in terms of getting them to the hospital, you got to think in terms of getting them the care that they need, whether that's, you know, an ALS intervention uh, or not. And if you can get that at the hospital quicker than you can get it to your scene by mm-hmm. requesting ALS, then not exactly. a lot of point. Um, yeah. Yeah. To be clear Makes though. Sense. Yeah. To be clear though, I, there are sometimes there are situations where it's worth making the transport time a little bit longer because you can get the intervention done sooner. Um, but uh, that's a different discussion yeah. for later, which I'll actually yeah. I'll, I'll make a note. I'll bring it up later. <laughs> All right. Okay. Nice. I won't. I won't remember. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, uh, I, and I say this because like at the time of the call, the, uh, Discovery says like they feel that if they are requesting ALS from the company, the company takes them seriously and they know that it's a big deal. Okay. So okay. that that's kind of why I bring up that fact. Um, uh, another thing about the system, there is a BLS fire service that can respond, but there's usually only like one person um, that is like, always on call or always available to respond oh. and everyone else is a volunteer. Uh. And so oftentimes uh, they will only come to uh, like mechanism of injury. Yeah. Like yeah. cardiac okay. arrests, you know, motor vehicle yeah. accidents, uh, respiratory failures and that. Um, I also want to note and uh, um, I, <laughs> you guys, uh, Nick, you'll like this. Uh, the call takers at the dispatch center don't use a standardized criterion for oh. call taking. Oh. Uh, they are left to their own devices to determine kind of what the chief complaint is and dispatch. Oh. Um, wow. which well, that's, uh, that ought to take you back. 
Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's the old, yeah. my old volunteer days. Oh yeah. 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 <clears throat> it's uh I don't know. It sounds like they need some help lifting. And then you know the crew gets there and it's like, oh yeah, the lifting we're doing is actually for the patient's heart. And right. we're that's, uh, yeah. trying to push ah. blood through the body. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. Wow. wow. Um <laughs> Let's see. I, I think uh, just another couple things before we move on to the actual call. Um, they in the EMTA scope, they don't have the ability to in, in this area. They they don't get to put, do any cardiac interventions like they can put them on the cardiac monitor, but they don't have like they're not giving epinephrine. Right. Um, there's no advanced airway placement. Um, and in that situation, if they're like, oh, we need to, you know, put a, a you know a, a breathing tube down someone's throat um or in their mouth they they basically just have to call for als uh, um, okay so no All right. gel. no not from the sounds of it no okay um so here we are into the call all right um, i'm scared <laughs> yep um art call takes place in the evening hours um this is early evening if you're a night owl um uh, or a you know a university student who suddenly remembered that they have a major paper due the next day um, <laughs> that that's fair. early evening um or it's late evening if you're an early morning shift worker or you're the type of person that thinks 4 p.m is a suitable time to eat dinner okay yeah gotcha Try. all right so it's sometime in that area um discovery and damages Wait, uh, uh, I'm sorry. again what, what time is it <laughs> again it's 4 p.m it's early evening early evening okay yeah it's late evening if you think dinner is at 4 p.m i okay <laughs> so early wow. evening. what's the lighting condition Guys, like outside <laughs> I, it's probably uh dark we'll go with dark Darkish. But, but not close to becoming light again okay I'm so hard, hard to tie your shoes but okay <laughs> Like if you were a high school student trying to uh, sneak out and go to a party, your parents would probably still be awake. Okay. Gotcha. Oh, gotcha. Okay. All right. So we're talking, we're talking like Jeopardy time. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. yeah. All, All right. right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Jesus. Nice. All right. <laughs> These are the facts that we really need to get down. That's yeah, this is, this is, <laughs> it right here. this is actually this crucial is really to the call. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for holding us up there. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, discovery and damages again, that's uh discovery is an EMTA and damages is an EMT. Um, they are counting the inventory on their ambulance uh, at the most distal post of the inner wheel area. Okay. okay. Uh, Prior to this, they'd run a few simple calls and uh, the shift has been uneventful. All right. But the wheels of Just EMS Dispatch Center notifies them that they are going to be going lights and sirens to a private residence for an 80 year old male with an altered mental status. Mm -hmm. uh, as they go en route, the only additional call notes they get are that the patient is vomiting. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. en route, D and D did start thinking and talking about what the what could be going on for this call but because of how dispatch is done in this system they they're kind of like i don't know it could be and it could be anything it could be nothing mm -hmm. um you know uh, let's just keep in mind like if the patient is vomiting you know on set that sort of thing um and they decide that because this call could be anything they're going to bring in all their equipment uh minus uh one piece which is a pediatric bag um, Makes sense. And that's, okay. and that's, that's where things go wrong. Oh no! Are they are they bringing in the oxygen tank? Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are they? Because they better yes. be. <laughs> yeah, yes. No, actually. Okay. Here's what they're bringing Good. in when they get to the scene. <laughs> they're going to bring in their cardiac monitor. They okay. have a jump kit that has okay. everything from like airway breathing interventions. Uh, I guess more breathing interventions, but like an OPA, NPA, non rebreather, etc. Um, they have their IV, uh, IO supplies, and they have some uh, medications in there. Uh, but they also have a separate D cylinder that they do bring with them on scenes because good you might there need you oxygen oh, yeah why? good because they listen yeah. to this podcast G yeah yes that's why yeah <laughs> yes. and that's I'm why just, they yeah. brought it. i'm just gonna say yep. yeah that, yes. that, that's our reach that's my influence yeah <laughs> i'll take credit for that cms 2020 effect all right 
Uh, so the crew arrived 10 minutes later uh, to what they describe as a well-kept two-story home in what's described as a nice suburban neighborhood. Um, they note that the home has a small set of stairs leading up to a front porch. And on top of those stairs and on that porch is a female who signals to the crew that this is the location that they're aiming for before retreating back into the home. Okay. Um, so the crew park take their equipment with them into the house, but leave the stretcher at the foot of the stairs outside the home. And as they enter the house, announce EMS, they hear a response summoning them to an adjacent room. Mm -hmm. um, I do need to add an additional uh, detail that will become more relevant later, uh, but here it is now. Uh, Discovery recently recovered from a bout of the vid or the okay. vid 19. Oh, yeah. oh. Um, and as a result, they no longer have a good sense of smell. Um, I, oh. I want to break out. I want to say uh, I lost my sense of smell before it was cool. Um, so I, <laughs> so <laughs> this might be a good thing. Yeah, I yeah. mean, I I think of it as sort of a superpower, but like I will admit, <laughs> uh, I sometimes feel dumb when I go like on the drunk patient and like they finally breathe on my face and I go like, oh, hey, guys, like. Yeah. I think alcohol might be a factor here and everyone else is back behind me going like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> like I'm drunk back here, man. Like yeah. I, <laughs> alcohol is a factor because yeah. I am intoxicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so their partner damages will later note that as they entered the home, there was a faint uh, putrid odor akin to rotten meat, mm -hmm. which became more potent the closer they got to oh. the patient. But discovery oh. at this point, Smells fine. Oh, <laughs> kind yeah, of a smell. nice home. So Discovery's yeah. enjoying the call. Gotcha. Yeah. Um. So the patient presents lying on a home hospital bed, which has been set up in a large room on the first floor. Mm. Um. For those that are not familiar, these are adjustable, like <sighs> hospital beds, I guess is the best description of it, Um. that can be put together in a home for patients who are bed confined, mm -hmm. um, or, like have mobility issues or are on hospice, right. et cetera. The beds typically have adjustments that allow the patient to like sit upright um, or sit in kind of a reclined position. They have rails on the sides and some of them are even adjustable in height um, so mm -hmm. that you can lower them to the floor or bring them up. Um, it, this is really common for EMS to encounter uh, oh, yeah. because you know yeah. these people are often sick well and i'm sure um, i'm sure yeah, nick and yeah. spencer will agree with me um the best place to put one of these if you have one of these in your home is uh the second story uh, if you have three <laughs> stories put it on the third story yeah. and third make sure you cram sure. it into yeah. a corner to where it's only accessible from one side yes 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 that's 100 yes. the best so yeah, yeah. absolutely and make sure to pack a bunch of stuff in the room around it oh absolutely yeah. well oh, yeah. yeah i mean it helps yeah. us with leverage yeah. you know yeah Yep. Um, I, I do want to say that like these are not typically permanent beds. Um, They're not. They are usually issued to patients uh, so that they can recover from an underlying mm -hmm. condition at home or mm -hmm. in the case of hospice patients, make it easier and safer for the patients and family to like care for their loved one in a in a place that the patient's comfortable with. Um, so like usually in these situations, there are medical supplies or like patient supplies near the bed. Um, in this case, in this house, uh, there was only a bed um, hmm. with no other like patient medical equipment noted to be nearby it. But um, yeah. Uh, but yes. And oftentimes when we see them, they are shoved in a corner uh, which is a huge pain in the ass. Thankfully, the beds oh, yeah. are kind of light to move. Um, That's true. As as long as the patient is also light to move, yeah. the bed is yeah. All right. So I want to give you guys kind of a doorway assessment of the patient as they walk in. So Oof. the patient is an 80 year old male noted to be lying on their right side. Um, they estimate from their visualization that the patient's about uh, 70 pounds and uh, five foot two. Um, in metric, that is approximately 32 kilograms and 157 centimeters. Um, but it could be like they could have been a little bigger, uh, just kind of based on their okay. position. But um, so it sounds that's like what a we got. reasonably small patient. Yes, Very, reasonably yeah. small patient. Yeah. Um, the patient has about five of those white hospital blankets draped over them, um, covering from their chest down. Uh, they do have an uh, exposed arm through a pajama top. Um, but more on that later. Um, uh, the patient's eyes are closed. They have uh, chocolate insure around their mouth. Oh, okay. uh, but otherwise, 
they appear to have a patent airway and are noted to be breathing about 30 plus times a minute. Okay. Um, Discovery checks a radial pulse as they approach the patient and as the adult daughter who's nearby, um, the adult daughter uh, now dubbed <clears throat> the defendant for the rest of the episode oh, no. s- starts telling them the HPI. Um, Discovery notes that the patient doesn't have a radial pulse and has a cool hand, but they do have a uh, a strong pulse uh, carotid at a rate of about 100 and the patient is centrally warm. Oh, yeah. um, they also can see that the patient's skin has uh, poor uh, tugger, 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 yeah, tugger, Roll Yeah, it's uh, yeah. that Winnie yeah. the Pooh character. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it would be the opposite because uh, Tigger had a lot of spring. That's and, true. Uh, <laughs> tugger, yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah. Yeah, thank you. Good pickup. Thanks, I, man. Dude, I know my Winnie the Pooh. Don't, I, don't come at me with that weak shit. Okay. All right. Um, lung sounds are quickly oscillated uh, with a high respiratory rate and are reported to be clear. So, guys, uh, thoughts on this rapid assessment? I mean, so far, it looks like we're hitting ABCs uh, yeah. fairly well. I mean, that, that's what I always want to see. It's not trauma call, so I'm not too worried about uh, insanguination typically when I go in. But um you know, you, you never know what you're going to find. Uh, but in this case, I would like to think that if there, was, if there was any obvious hemorrhage or bleeding, they would have made note. Yeah, uh, I'm afraid to move the blankets. So yeah, very mm. true, very true. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm this thinking... is funny to me because I can't see Chris's face, but I can see Nick's, <laughs> and and I can see him replaying in his head. Yeah, every I've... single one of these calls he's ever. Oh had. yeah, I've run this call. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, well, I thinking... would say you say dried chocolate and sugar around their mouth. I'm not yeah. 100% sure it's chocolate and share. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do we taste it? Are we sure? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. That, that is why I say taste every substance, guys. <laughs> that's that's why yeah. you, you just have oh. to know. Uh, but yeah. in terms of what I think, man, I, this guy makes me nervous. I mean, especially when we got that yeah. respiratory rate of 30 plus. Yeah, um, yeah. I think it's sepsis here. Yeah, the the yeah. defendant um, is the uh, the adult daughter there. Um no, don't read into that, by yeah. the way. So we, yeah, and we I'm can't just... find, no, not not at all. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, you know, we can't find a radial pulse, cool hand. Uh, when we do find a carotid, it, it's at a, it's at a hundred, which I don't know, Nick, what do you think of the, what do you think of that heart rate of a hundred? Uh, definitely elevated, you know, yeah. especially for that situation, you know, guys lying in the bed. So doing nothing. Um, yeah. Doing nothing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Very high. Yeah, I don't know. So, so what are we going to find when we move the blankets? This is, I'm, I'm scared right now. Right. Mm. Okay. There's a cat. Well, <laughs> I mean that would be kind of a nice finding. Uh, that that right? was actually my uh, that was actually my my recall to to a to a call where never mind that's a story for another time. But a cat was involved. That's another episode. We, oh, we, we found we found a cat under a blanket once. Oh, and uh, oh. the patient was a, a deceased. Lot. Use your oh. imagination. Okay. Oh, all right. Gotcha. The cat was hungry. Got it. All right. Anyway, uh, ooh, moving on. The defendant tells the crew as they approach the patient that the patient is their parent and that they called because, well, they were trying to feed the patient um, uh, chocolate flavored and sure. And they noticed that the patient w- didn't seem to be swallowing it. Um, hmm. d- Discovery said that what the defendant described was similar to how some folks will try to, like, force feed a diabetic with low blood sugar. Right. Um, yeah. Mm. Uh, so they kind of went like, oh, oh, okay. Um, and the defendant tells discovery that the patient hasn't been eating very well over the past few days. Uh, normally they have, you know, like five chocolate insurers a day. Um, but the last couple days they'd been down to two and, wow. uh, this evening they started vomiting shortly after, uh, the defendant tried to feed them. Um, okay. they also say that the patient wasn't responding anymore and that's why they called nine one one. Hmm. Um, they do tell the crew that the patient has uh, Alzheimer's or dementia or something above at baseline, um, but is normally able to speak to them in small sentences and express uh, the patient's needs. Uh, when asked how long the patient's been like this, um, this being how long have they been unresponsive, uh, the defendant gives a vague answer of about like, oh, maybe like one to two hours ago. Um hmm. Well, Discovery is trying to get uh, more of this history. Uh, they ask damages to place the patient on the monitor for vitals and to get a CPG um, because, yeah, you know, they're like, oh, maybe this is a blood sugar issue. Uh, yeah. They do recall that damages gave them a somewhat incredulous look 
uh, at this point, but uh, they did comply with this request and we will put a pin in that. Mm -hmm. Okay. How about we put a Lancet in that? Uh, okay. Oh, hey. CBD oh. check. <laughs> nice. Nice. I wouldn't because I don't check blood sugars. Yeah, we know that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, more history of present illness. Um, so the defendant reports that the patient was discharged from a hospital uh, something like four months ago, and they were came home on home health uh, with regular home health visits. But they say that about a month and a half ago to two months ago, the home health folks stopped coming because the patient was supposed to go on hospice, but mm -hmm. hospice care hasn't come. And so the defendant is the primary care person for the patient. Uh, Discovery notes that when they start asking for more specifics about the patient and their history, the defendant's answers are really vague and just sort of unsatisfying. Um, the patient has a medical history of everything and heart problems. Um, and the defendant is very adamant that the patient just be transported to the closest hospital and insisting that everything with the patient has been mostly fine until about one to two hours ago. Mm. Um, you know, what meds do they take? They don't take any meds. Do they have any allergies? Oh, no allergies. Mm. Mm. Um, as damages exposes the patient, and gets vitals, it's around this time that Discovery no longer believes a word the defendant is saying about the patient. Oh. All right. And God, this is for warning. Again, this is yeah. this is the warning part because what yeah. we're, uh, this is disturbing. Um, I, you know, it's disturbing for the crew. Um, I think it's disturbing for anybody. So here we go. Yeah. All right. So here's why they don't believe um, the defendant. So while Discovery was working on getting that history of present illness and medical history, damage damages gets the patient on the pulse oximeter and the blood pressure cuff and also does get a CBG. Um, they also pull back five layers of hospital blankets. Oh, don't do it. Mm -mm. Mm. And this is the time that Discovery discovers that their nose does still work uh, because the smell, <sighs> the smell of what they described as like rotting flesh rotten meat <laughs> oh, hits yeah. their face full force yeah uh, so here mm -hmm. we go the patient is lying in a fetal position on their right side with their head hyperextended um and they are indented into a deep valley yeah. into the bed yeah. yeah uh they note that the pulse uh the patient's pulse is visible through their abdomen uh, as is their breathing rate um, the patient has their left arm and leg through uh, pairs of pajamas, but is otherwise unclothed. And it, it's like, hey, they they got an arm in the pajamas and then that was kind of as and, and a leg in the pajamas. And that's kind of as far as the, mm -hmm. they could get in getting clothes on them. Um, the patient's leg that is visible, that isn't in uh, a pajama pants, uh, is noted to have about an eighth of an inch of dried lotion on it. Um, mm. metric folks, you'll have to convert an eighth of an inch on your own. I didn't do that for you. <laughs> um, Sorry, Canadian listen, listeners. Yeah. yeah. Look, just yep. to help you guys out, it's half of a quarter of an inch, which is half of a half. Wow. Which is half of a half. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, the crew, the crew observed that the patient is lying directly on a vinyl mattress top. Hmm. Um, all oh, visible the, portions no of the vinyl. Whatsoever? No, no. Yeah. No bottom sheets. Oh, All the no. visible portion of the vinyl beyond the blankets was like scrubbed clean or just clean appearance. But yeah. the crew noticed that there is a pugnant brown liquid in the valley of the bed right next to the patient. Oh, um, nice. And it was kind of one of those things where like, oh, is this a like the patient have a recent bowel movement um, or like, is this chocolate and sure? Um, yeah. But the consistency of the liquid and the smell don't match. Um, and additionally, there is a brown fur growing out of the liquid uh, that was consistent with uh, mold or fungi. Hey. So um, vitals, by the way, um, the monitor is unable to determine any vitals, uh, yeah. SpO2 or heart rate. Um, but we do know that the patient's heart rate is 100. Um, you can see it just by looking at it mm -hmm. um and the auto cuff also doesn't read but a cbg was checked it is 144 milligrams per deciliter or eight millimoles so um this is one of those situations where they feel that there is an incompatibility with the story yeah. and the patient presentation oh, yeah. so 
Yeah. What Chris um, and Nick and Sam, what would you do if you were on this scene and you just made this discovery? What are your priorities? What what do you do here? Wow. Mm. Is this so I've been on a call like this and uh, it's just the same thing. It was just like um, the caretaker for weeks or months didn't really know what to do. And um, uh, it was their mother and uh, same situation where it was just uh, a bad call. Um, and I remember my priority at that point was to just get the patient out of there. And uh, so we moved him onto the stretcher and got into the back of the truck and then made sure we um, uh, contacted um, PD. Yeah. Okay. I, mean, I think when it comes, yeah. I mean, I think, uh, this this is this is hard. Um, you know, I, mean, I, I think you just touched on like, hey, like you know, the story and this isn't lining up, and and the main reason is is uh, the the defendant kind of appeared to paint more of an acute picture. Um, yeah, and yeah. you know, you know, things have you know, just happened, that kind of stuff. But there, obviously, there are things that are going on here that that take time. Um, you know, this this smell of rotting meat, this uh, yeah. you know, the condition of the patient that they're currently in. Um, these are things that occur over time. And by the way, like having skin on, on vinyl that will get sticky. Mm -hmm. I mean, sk skin, skin breaks down a lot easier than, than we realize, uh, you know, for those of us who, you know, we go to bed and then we get up and then we're up for the rest of the day. It's not a problem, but for people who are bed confined, skin breakdown is a real thing and skin breakdown. Once you start cracking open the skin, which is kind of your body's first line of defense in terms of immunity, it's just that physical barrier that the skin is. Once you start breaking that down. It's just uh, an open door for infection. And what's going to happen in patients that get these massive infections like this uh, from any multitude of sources for this poor guy um, is you're going to see, uh, you know, we're going to have the, the body's going to try to adjust pH balance by increasing the respiratory rate. So you're going to have a rapid, rapid respiratory rate, which this guy has. Um, mm -hmm. The vasculature is going to get uh, dilated and leaky and they're going to start third spacing all the fluid out of the vasculature and you're going to see blood pressure just tank. Uh, yeah. On top of that, um, so it, it doesn't. I mean, th this this patient looks like a massive sepsis patient. So in terms of, of what I would do in this case for right now, uh, I think it, like Nick said, is we just got to let's focus on the patient care, see what we can do for the for the patient, understanding that we need to we probably need to take some notes, and there's going to be a lot of uh, follow up oh, yeah. and paperwork uh, with this coming afterwards. Okay. And All right. I'm wondering, Spencer, what's the condition of the skin? Because um, obviously, I'm getting the picture that this patient's been on his side, probably had not turned in weeks, months. Uh, what do we see when when we move the patient? Um, so they have not yet moved the patient. Okay. They have just exposed the patient. Um, the skin is described as like very, you know, that that, that poor tugger to yeah, you know, very um emaciated looking mm -hmm. um which you know that makes sense um yeah. but they have not yet uh, gotten to visualize the underside of the patient yeah. so okay. um and uh yeah okay so it sounds like you guys both say like okay like regardless of how the patient got this way the priority is to get them out of this environment and yeah. get them to the hospital uh, yeah. ASAP and, and stabilize. Um, okay. So, uh, discovery and damages, uh, they both recognize at this point, um, that the patient is incredibly sick, mm -hmm. um, and they want to get the patient out of their ASAP. Um, and they also, this is also the point where discovery goes like, I, I just stopped listening to the defendant because I no longer trusted a word they were saying. Yeah. Um, right. So uh, Discovery tells their partner, hey, I'm going to go out to the ambulance and grab a, a moving tarp or a, a mega mover mm -hmm. device. That's what we call them out here. Um, I think that's actually a brand name, right? Mm -hmm. Chris, is that? Uh, yeah, yeah, Mega, Mega Mover. Mover is. Yes, it is. Yeah. 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 Um, hey, Mega Mover, if you're looking for sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> or if you're looking to sponsor. Or, yeah, if you're looking to sponsor. sponsor yeah, you. No, I will not <laughs> sponsor you. Yeah. No. This Mega um, Mover brought to you by EMS 2020. <laughs> <laughs> that one was free. <laughs> just put a link on all of the Mega Movers, like, or it's just a uh, sewn in there. EMS 2020 yeah. themed Mega like Movers. It. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Um, so while, out, while they're out in the ambulance, they radio for an ALS response. Um, okay. And okay. a supervisor hearing the request announces that, yeah, they're they are coming en route to intercept with them. Um, and the plan is not to like 
essentially they're like, yeah, if you they want to go like, hey, we're going to start transporting this patient as soon as we get them out of here uh, because we think they're really sick. And the supervisor is not trying to head to the scene. He's going to try and meet up with them in mm-hmm. route to the hospital. And okay. and they decide the again, like the the daughter wants the patient to be transported to the closest hospital, mm-hmm. but the closest hospital does not have any ICU capabilities. It's uh, essentially just yeah. sort of a standalone ER. Okay. And so they want, they're like, we need to go to a higher level of care. Mm-hmm. So the next closest one is about a 25 minute drive from the scene. Okay. So that's um, not, it's not that bad. Yeah. So, um, in, all right. You may be getting to this, so I may be getting ahead of you, but they go out and they call for an ALS intercept. Do they also call for PD? They did not call for PD. Okay. Good question, though. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so for you clinical guys, when you go out to the ambulance to call for the supervisor, are you also calling PD? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I think so. I mean, it, it, it. I mean, it's going to depend on how it an depends. agency is set up. Yeah, <laughs> it depends. you can't say that. <laughs> yeah, that, that's Not Sam's line, it. man. Come on. Right. <laughs> I, I was gonna. I gotcha. I was gonna bring a bring a beverage and, and take a drink every time Sam says it depends, but then I realized <laughs> I would not make it to the end of the episode, I'm sure, by the time we started doing it this. That's, that it Spencer stole it. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it's gonna depend a little bit on how uh, on how the agencies are set up, but generally like uh, mm. you know, so so I may end up calling the supervisor and advising the supervisor what's going on, and then it's on them to call PD, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. but either way, I mean, if the ultimate question is, you know, as me, the the person on scene, do I uh, call P? You know, am, am I going to start whatever ball rolling that I have to get rolling to get PD there, uh, or at least notify PD? I mean, yes, I I would. Um, right. So hmm. uh, yeah, I would too. I, I I guess for me, it sort of depends on you know my priority is getting the patient out, like the patient out of there, mm-hmm. um, and. I don't know how long it will take for police to respond Mm -hmm. or if a police response will potentially worsen the situation. And I don't want to wait to have to explain to the police like why they got called out there with the patient. So, um, you know, and and the the uh, discovery didn't call the supervisor as a like, hey, this is an abusive situation. Like, I'm really worried. He was calling because he's like, I need an ALS provider to respond to help care for this patient because they recognize they're sick. Sick. And that's that's the only thing that they really uh, talked about, um, to my understanding, was just Hey, how can I get you to me as fast as possible so that we can care for the patient? Well, I want to want to put a land set in that for a second because we want to come back <laughs> That's and talk about mandated reporters and all that type of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Let's we'll, we'll yeah. talk about that. Um, and then one one other thing. So I think uh, to me, sort of the goal because you know, I mean, you're right, Spencer. I don't think I would delay this, especially this patient's critical sure. uh, at this point. So I don't think I'd want to delay them getting to the hospital. But you know, is there uh, an, an option or or a, a reasonable way to say, hey? We need to notify, like I tell supervisor at least, like, hey, we need to notify PD because I, I believe we may have an abuse slash neglect mm-hmm. thing right here. I'm not able to stay on see, on scene right now. If I did, it'd be a detriment to this patient, mm-hmm. possibly cost the patient their life. So I have to get this patient to the hospital. But heads up, supervisor, you should probably let PD know that we're taking this person to the hospital and that there may be a mm-hmm. crime here. So because yeah. mm-hmm. I, I don't imagine let, the police would want me to delay and possibly yeah. cost the patient their life either, you know. Let, let's get let's get into that because I I mean there's the question of the priority is obviously what's in the best interest for the patient in yep. the immediate time and that's sure. their like this is a patient who could we could easily all see this oh, patient yeah. going into cardiac arrest oh yeah but I don't think that getting the abuse part reported after we get them there necessarily changes anything if that makes sense. Yeah. Like yeah. the only yeah. reason I would want PD on the scene would be if I was anticipating the person becoming violent, like the, the person sure. who is on scene um, preventing me from being able to perform that first priority. If right. they're not, then it's, I, I don't know that I would pull that trigger and start that additional ball rolling where like people would, um, you know, that like people are going to have questions and I'm going to be busy with the patient and I don't want to answer their questions mm-hmm. until I'm at a headspace where I can, right. if that makes mm-hmm. sense. So yeah. I, 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 I agree. Police would be great if they could get there quick and 
I've always worried about it, but mm-hmm. otherwise if I don't need them yet, then I, I can see not doing that. Right. Um, so, um, discovery and damages again, they, they want to, they want to get this person out of here. Um, yeah, they've got ALS they've, uh, on in route, they've got their lifting sheet. Um, and discovery comes back into the house with the lifting tarp and tells the defendant like, Hey, I know you wanted to take the patient to this closer hospital. We got to go to this farther one because this person is going to need ICU services that, uh, this close hospital can't provide. Um, and, there's a little bit of an argument, but ultimately, like it, it wasn't really presented as a choice. And uh, mm-hmm. ultimately, like the defendant relents and goes, OK, well, that then fine. Take them there. Right. Um, yeah. So discovery and damages set up to roll the patient onto the lifting tarp, but they aren't able to get the patient to roll out of uh, the crevasse. No. Um, mm. I'm not sure mm. if it was asked or it was volunteered by the defendant, but the, the, the this is around the time where they're like, the defendant tells them like, oh, yeah, no, we I, I rotate the patient regularly. No, you don't. No, no, no. no. <laughs> no. Mm-hmm. If you yeah. rotate the patient regularly, you would have seen all this stuff long ago, yeah. you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So, uh, yeah, um, I, I don't know if they asked or if it was volunteered, but uh, that is what the defendant claims. So um, no matter what this crew seems to do, they they really can't get the, the patient to like roll. Um, mm-hmm. And Discovery realizes that it's because um, the patient's Sorry. skin has seemingly fused into the vinyl. That's a real yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 I've seen and, it. Uh, I've seen the, those socks. The, yeah. That's never good. And the covering yeah. sticks to the patient and doesn't allow them to be lifted out of the bed or to Ugh. like move. Um, oh. They are literally stuck. Now, there are good people are going to have questions because, again, like Chris, you pointed out, uh, we walk around every day and our skin doesn't grow into our clothes yeah, or right. we don't, you know, like melt into the bed. But this actually, I, I tried to find a medical article about this. I didn't find anything that mm. came from a, uh, a quality site, but I think the, the layman's explanation actually probably serves well enough, which is your skin breaks down. It also tries to heal. And mm-hmm. new skin will grow. And if there's breakdown in the, you know, like if you're on a couch, your skin breaks down while you're laying on the couch, it will start to grow and it can grow into the cloth, like the cloth mm-hmm. of the couch, therefore making you a part couch. You okay, person. Sam? <laughs> uh, look, this is why I represent EMS. I don't. <laughs> Do EMS? Yeah, yeah. For this exact reason. Yeah, Yikes. I mean, so and, yeah, so yeah, this, it, and this happens, right? Because uh, I mean, oh, yeah. especially if if you don't, this is why you rotate patients, is mm-hmm. because if they stay on one side or one area of skin stays down, uh, there's just there's pressure on it, right? And you know, blood is fluid, and it will if you put pressure on an area, it gets hard for you know blood flow to get there, and that causes tissue damage and then tissue mm-hmm. breaks down and then it tries to heal because you know tissue be tissueing and uh then it, it yeah whatever <laughs> whatever is <laughs> yeah ex- exactly <laughs> and then yeah uh you know and then whatever it happens to be in the way is just it's gonna grow around and that's oh yeah. man yeah. yeah yeah all right so uh uh let's put you all back in this what do you guys do now because you now have a patient who you literally can't uh Roll Ooh. onto your lifting tarp. Trauma shears to the bed. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. a good one. That's actually better than what I was thinking. Cause just cut oh. out the section of vinyl. I was thinking try yeah. and transport the whole mattress, but that could be a pain in the arse, especially depending on the size of the mattress. <laughs> yeah. I, I I'm impressed. You guys both thought of the things that these guys did. Um oh. so the, the first thing they considered was okay, take the whole can mattress. We take, can we take the whole mattress? Oh, but wow. the problem is there's two of them. They don't know how they're going to secure the mattress safely. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that and so that becomes kind of a, 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 a halting point. The other thing that they considered was, OK, maybe this is one where we request fire for mm-hmm. lifting assistance or mm-hmm. extrication. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, but they go, we don't know, you know, like if we get other providers here, we don't know how long that will take, how yeah. many will come. Mm-hmm. And if they 
would be any better off. Like, it, mm-hmm. yeah, like they, they yeah. might not have it. They're like, I've never, in, like, we don't have a tool for this. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they really aren't sure what to do. Um, but damages, uh, one year EMT looks at discovery and says, what if we just cut the vinyl? There you go. And that is quickly ag- agreed upon as the route to go. Yeah, so nice. damages takes trauma shears and cuts the vinyl bed covering uh, just kind of around the patient. But they leave enough room on each side so that they have like a lifting sheet, lifting. I guess, yeah, yeah, yeah. to mm-hmm. lift the patient up. Um, after good shot yeah. damages right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, after they cut the patient out, they are able to move the patient to the edge of the bed and onto the lifting tarp. Um, and as they lift the patient out of the crevasse, uh, the patient screams. Oh. Ooh, and then resumes their unresponsiveness. Sure. Um, underneath the spot where the patient is laying is more mold and more brown liquid. Yeah. My goodness. Yeah. And oh, one of the things that I, that I want yeah. to clarify is, I mean, this may, this may seem obvious to people who are in EMS, but just in case it's not, when we're talking about like this, the skin is fused, it's not just like, all right, well, we pull it away and a layer of skin is going to come with. Uh, removing when the skin gets this weak, especially in someone who has poor skin trigger and uh, if you're dehydrated, especially or other medical conditions, trying to remove this vinyl uh, can can be detrimental. You can remove a significant amount of skin. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. oh, yeah. And uh, and that can be that, that can be lethal. And yeah. um, my first degloving injury, a degloving injury is basically where you have an extremity, for example, like your arm and the skin gets peeled off for whatever reason. Most common degloving injury is where someone has a wedding ring and it gets caught yeah. in the back of a truck when they try and jump off or something and it peels off mm. the skin of the finger. The first degloving yeah. injury I ever went on was when a um, – it was a – I think like a med assistant or someone at a nursing home, uh, someone uh, – it's not a nursing home, but well, I forget the exact situation, but either way – It's a some sort of home health situation, I think, maybe. I don't know. But this lady, she's trying to help a patient and she's not very experienced. And the patient's like, well, I need to change my socks. I haven't changed them for a while. And by a while, we mean like a year. Oh, yeah. yeah. And her skin had grown into it. And the uh, caregiver just grabbed the sock and pulled. And Mm. like, yeah, it's really stuck on there and pulled really hard and basically just degloved this poor lady's uh, Mm. foot. So uh, stuck skin, it's more than gross. If you try and uh, if you, it's more than growth, gross, it's, 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 it can be lethal if you Mm -hmm. accidentally remove too much of it. So anyway, that's why we're trying to take such care in how we move this patient. Uh, Yeah. Um, I I think we should call those situations uh, home hell instead of home health. Yeah. 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 Mm, uh, No. Yeah. Mm. All right. Here we go. The patient is taken out uh, to the stretcher, loaded into the ambulance, and uh, the defendant is asked on the way out about the patient's DNR status, um, if there's a pulsed form or whatever the equivalent is for this place. Uh, uh, The defendant has no idea what that is, um, but after being sort of like caught up like, hey, uh, do you want, like, would the patient want to be resuscitated Mm -hmm. and all that? Uh, The defendant says... Yeah, all of the above, everything. Oh. To which, uh, yeah, uh, I, do everything. Uh, I bring up an ex- an interesting question for later, uh, Sam. Which is, I'm literally does this person this get to say because mm, they're yeah. the mm. they're the suspected uh, problem in this? Yeah, well, uh, and, and, it's and interesting. And, and, and yeah. when can someone make that call for somebody else? You know, those kind of questions. Yeah. So I, yeah. I, just, I just wrote down, yeah, no DNR question mark. Can they override? So yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. that'd be right. um, later. So the total scene time is 13 minutes and the hospital is uh, 25 minutes away. So it, the patient is now in the ambulance. Discovery is in the back because they are the highest level provider. And they are just looking at this patient going like, I don't even know where to start yeah. just right. because of how sick the patient is. Um, yeah. they, they do put the patient on a non rebreather mask at 15 liters a minute for yeah. the, you know, unreading SPO2 value, uh, the patient's breathing 40 times a minute. Um, and they do get a blood pressure, uh, an auscultated one of 140 over 90. Um, the huh. patient remains unresponsive. Uh, they're, they get put on a four lead and they are determined to be in a sinus tachycardia, mm-hmm. um, hmm. And damages uh, returned to the house to grab a kit and uh, ended up taking a picture of the uh, bed Star. that they pulled the Star. patient out of. Um, and then uh, as they get into the ambulance to take off, they request police respond to the hospital. Okay. Oh, yeah, I think that's pretty oh, yeah. Good. 
That's a good comment. I'm good with that. I'm good with that. All right. Yeah. Um, all right. I'm making a little note here. Camera. Okay. So um, Discovery realizes at this point that they haven't really actually observed the patient's airway. Um, be, and, the, you know, like they're like, oh, yeah, the patient was vomiting. They were being force fed chocolate and sure their breathing and their lungs were clear, but I didn't actually like look in their airway. So they open the patient's mouth, find that it is coated in chocolate and sure residue. Mm -hmm. um, they do try and like use an oral suction to clear out the airway, but like nothing comes up. It all appears to be dried to the mouth. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. They weren't able to open the patient's mouth all the way. And discovery notes that the patient's tongue appears to be dried and stuck to the Ooh. bottom of their mouth. Mm -hmm. um, now I will say, cause people might go like, wow, uh, this is really bad. And it is, but this one might've happened soon. Like, sooner more acutely i guess because if you're breathing 40 times a minute mm -hmm. um dry it's gonna dry humidified out. air your, yeah. your mouth is going to be so dry yeah. um and yeah like i 100 percent believe that you know like it wouldn't take long for your tongue to decide like yeah I'm, I'm just gonna stick here <laughs> yep mm -hmm. yeah yeah um yeah. Uh, they also check the patient's pupils, reporting them to be fixed and dilated. Mm -hmm. And they note that there's a layer of crust that is coating the patient's mm -hmm. eyes. Um, eyes. At, while they're while they're doing this, they're checking vitals every five minutes and they report that the blood pressure, heart rate and the patient's level of consciousness remain unchanged. Mm -hmm. um, heart rate is 120. Blood pressure is still in the 140s. And patient is a GCS of three. Uh, they do say that if we had an entitled cannula, we would have put it on the patient to get a more accurate represent like mm -hmm. count for the breathing. I was going to ask. And also, I'm, I'm interested in the entitled value itself. But yeah. they do not have this at they did not have this tool available at the time. Oh, that would make it service. more difficult. That's OK. Fair. Yep. 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 Um, they also have this thing where they're like, I know we're going to ALS intercept and I want to have this patient prepped and ready. So they want to get IV IO access, mm -hmm. but given that they have an SPO2 that reading that isn't reading um, and they have this massive ventilatory rate, they decide that they're just going to prioritize supporting breathing for mm -hmm. the patient. Mm -hmm. um, so Discovery uses a BVM to assist the patient with their breathing, um, basically providing pressure support. Um, they did say that they tried their best to match the patient's rate, but notice that after like four minutes of doing that, uh, it became kind of harder to bag uh, the patient. Um, so there's kind of two things that could be happening here. I uh, just want to, I don't think this is a big thing, so I'm just going to break away here. Um, if you are providing pressure support to a patient, like you're trying to breathe for them, it's almost better to do kind of an intermittent pressure support, mm -hmm. especially if they have a high rate. Because if somebody's breathing 40 times a minute and you're trying to support that and you're giving them, you know, decent sized tidal volumes, uh, then you're really kind of running the risk of uh, pressure, uh, like of breath stacking, um, making it hard to get more air into the patient because mm -hmm. uh, uh, you're not letting them have enough time to exhale. So that is one reason that that could have been harder mm -hmm. um, to to bag the patient. Um, the other will make sense in a moment when we get to it. So you're saying like bag every few breaths to theirs, like assist with yeah. every, every few. Yeah. Every, every, exactly. Every, every because then breaths. way that way you're not uh, running the risk of breath stacking and you're still giving them good ventilatory support. Right. Because if you're uh, trying to breathe for every single breath, you're probably going to be maintaining a seal that entire time. And if you're maintaining mm -hmm. PEEP, as well, which probably, which you should be if you're bagging somebody. Uh, mm -hmm. If you have a peep valve on there, uh, then yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Because then what you're going to do is they won't be able to exhale the whole way. You'll be maintaining peep, and then you'll be reducing the yeah. amount of volume air that actually moves because not I, all of it will be able to get out. Okay. Yeah. I, I, I think what it really is is just like, because there's no peep valve on this. I think it's really just sure. like at such a high rate. They're not getting you're generating auto peep because they're not able to get oh, yeah. all, all those breaths out with that high rate. But yeah, gotcha. Um, so uh, at the 17 minute mark of the transport, a paramedic supervisor I'm calling deposition okay. enters the back of the ambulance. <laughs> all right, Depo deposition is described as a longtime paramedic. Um, but Discovery reports that even they were aghast at the patient's presentation. Yeah. Uh, the first question they ask is, oh, what is this? Mm -hmm. And followed by, 
what does this patient have a dnr um oh. and and by the way like this isn't a like they like, stop and they discuss and like hey what's going on okay now let's go this is a they hop in they get going intercept mm -hmm. so d and d uh, and, and D are uh, once again en route to the hospital, lights and sirens, and their ETA is about eight minutes. Um, Discovery spends several minutes giving deposition a rundown of the patient and the patient care done so far. While this is happening, deposition recommends that, hey, maybe put an NPA in the patient, which does help with the airway compliance. Mm -hmm. Um, after, after deposition gets caught up, they briefly take over assisting the patient's ventilations so that discovery can make a hospital call. Deposition and discovery then do a 12 lead. Um, there is no STEMI, but there are hyperacute T waves noted. Um, okay, and, course. and that, that makes that sense. That tracks. Yeah. Yep. 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 Um, deposition tries to get a humoral IO, but it's unsuccessful. Mm -hmm. So discovery who's uh, back at the head, uh, does get an EJ. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, they, they briefly consider, uh, intubating the patient, but the patient's head is also fused. Um, oh, and man. so they're, they're just like, yeah, we, the, no, there's yeah. no point. Let's just, yeah. let's just do this. They did notice, um, that the patient's innate ventilatory rate also decreased and that they are now taking deeper breaths on their unassisted uh breaths okay. so um that does seem to have improved uh with the course of their treatment um on arrival to the ed other providers and the service assist in getting the patient into the hospital uh the patient gets taken to a large resuscitation room and all the staff are present and they are appalled by mm -hmm. what uh, discovery has brought them um discovery gives report but realizes that uh in all this time they actually have no name or date of birth Oops. or like any identifying oh, wow. information yeah um but Hospitals between law enforcement but between uh, law enforcement and the hospital, uh, they are able to figure that out based on the address um, and uh, all of that and are able to figure out who the patient is. Um, discovery and damages inform uh, the police of their encounter. And as I said, uh, damages, when they returned to grab a kit, uh, was able to give them photographic uh, evidence uh, of the bed. So. Um, here is the follow-up to the surprise of no one. Uh, this patient did die. Um, yeah, pretty shortly after their arrival. Um, the the description they that uh, discovery got after the fact was that the patient's skin and musculature on the downward side was basically just gone. Yeah, it was essentially uh. you know blood vessels, bone, and ligaments Ooh. and and whatnot. Uh. Um, what a way to and go. the the defendant was prosecuted for elder abuse. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So there, that's the call. My wow. goodness. So, oh man. So, I mean, I know we have, we have a lot to dig into uh, <laughs> and, and I know there's, there's probably a lot of people that have a lot of clinical questions and I'll try and touch on some of those, but I think a lot of this is going to be a legal focus, but just to kind of summarize everything. So we've got discovery and damages. They respond to report of an elderly male patient with uh, altered mental status and vomiting. Uh, mm -hmm. The crew arrives to a fairly well-kept home uh, and they find a male patient uh, lying in a home hospital bed. Uh, history gets gathered from the defendant, but it's incredibly vague. I love all these names, by the way. Uh, mm -hmm. An assessment of the patient reveals that the history is not just vague, but entirely unreliable. It does not make sense yeah. to what they are seeing. Uh, the crew then recognize they have an acutely sick patient. They prioritize transporting the patient uh, and uh, requesting ALS, which they get uh, in the form of the uh, supervisor. I believe deposition was the name for the mm -hmm. uh, supervisor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, perfect. Which we'll uh, be doing shortly. Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think it's yeah. an apt name. Uh, the struggle uh, to get the patient out of bed uh, because the patient has been fused to the vinyl covering of the bed. Uh, yeah, because of the skin breakdown. So police are then requested uh, to respond to the emergency room at the start of the transport. Uh, then DD and, and actually D uh, transport uh, emergently to a farther away hospital because that one has ICU services. The closest one, which is what the defendant wanted them to go to, does not. Uh, but it sounds like they are pretty easily able to uh, 
More like advice. Yeah. yeah. They advise mm-hmm. the defendant. This is where we're going. Uh, yeah. So, this is where we're going. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in route, Discovery prioritizes supporting breathing uh, and uh, establishing access. Uh, they prioritize uh, supporting breathing over establishing access. Uh, they intercept with deposition the ALS supervisor to complete the transport. Uh, ultimately, the patient does not uh, survive, although the patient did improve somewhat uh, yeah. on the <clears throat> way in. So, yeah. As far as clinical topics that I would want to cover, um, I think – let's see. Oh, one of the things that you mentioned is they had a visible pulse in the abdomen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, few reasons that could be to my knowledge. Uh, one, uh, you could, sometimes you have people who are so emaciated and slender that the, abdo- the, the, pul- the pulsating abdominal aorta just shows through. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. But there is another – there, there is another cause that can happen. Sometimes you can have a, um, an, you can have a, a ballooning of the abdominal aortic aneurysm oh. where the wall has been thinned. Oh. So even in patients that are not emaciated, um, you can palpate a palpable pulse uh, yeah. because you have a, an aneurysm going on. Um, so that could be that could be the other reason. Uh, I think in this case, it's because the patient was just so dang small. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. In terms of clinical treatments. Um, I don't know, Nick, what kind of clinical treatments would you think? Them? I mean, to me, you know, this patient. Yeah. Listening, I thought they did pretty good. Um, yeah. I'm trying to think of other than fluid administration. Um, you know, there's there's nothing really there I would have done any differently. Yeah. Or BLS crew, I thought they did pretty well. Yeah. I mean, yeah. They, they intercepted with the paramedic uh, ultimately, but with such a short transport time from that point forward, yeah. it didn't really seem like it was in, you know entirely necessary to um, to really. I mean, yeah, air, airway is one thing. Um but they were managing it. Yeah, you know? they, they were managing it and they didn't, you know, and they talked about, you know, the, the patient's head was kind of fused and stuck in place. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. you know, when, when you think about things like innovation, like there's two things, right? Like how much does a patient need it versus how difficult is this innovation going to be? Mm-hmm. And yeah. if you're talking about, because uh, you're probably going to have to RSI this patient because we do know they mm-hmm. respond, right? Because when we picked them up, mm-hmm. they screamed. And when you RSI somebody, you take away their own ability to breathe. So yeah. not getting that tube is not great. Yeah. You know, you can really yeah. cause an issue. And if we're going to have these added difficulties, of what's going on with this guy? And this is a fragile patient at mm-hmm. that. I mean, mm-hmm. we've talked about this before, at least Spencer and I have, uh, and that is um, resuscitate before you innovate. You know, right. innovation is yeah. kind of a traumatic thing. And so if you have someone who's kind of on the ragged edge there, giving them all these paralytics and all these uh, – sedatives and then sticking a tube down their throat uh Mm -hmm. that could that could turn it into a code really quick so this is not a patient i would be too keen on innovating unless something acutely wrong with the airway occurred like yeah yeah which i don't i I just don't see that right now i i actually think that the the decision they made was the the good one in terms of like when they were transporting because we all we all kind of it's like i know that the hospital's going to need a an iv or want vascular access and like in an ideal world i would love to get vascular access Mm -hmm. but if you have an spo2 that isn't reading and a patient who's breathing 40 times a minute then breathing just has to take the priority you're you're stuck on me and, and I think they did a good job recognizing that. And it, it doesn't hurt that the patient had a blood pressure of 140 over 90. That yeah. further kind of supports that decision. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, yeah, like when somebody else shows up, go, please get me access. You know, yes. <laughs> right. like that's yeah. that's that is perfect. Yeah. Um, good news is the uh, blood pressure wasn't super hypertensive yeah. which is kind of i i was expecting to have a blood pressure mm-hmm. that was absolute garbage but we got 140 over 90. yeah, yeah. you know um so. yeah uh, speaking of blood pressure you know like it sucks when you're on scene and you don't have any vitals except mm-hmm. for you know like well the heart rate's 100 and yeah. uh, the sure. breathing's fast the breathing uh, yeah. it it might be worthwhile and this is again this is just i don't know um the nitpickiest of nitpicks but it's like, hey, the auto cuff didn't read. Um, oh, I don't, just yeah. get just get a manual blood pressure yes. right there. Yes. Like, yes. Um, if I you agree. can, you know. I agree. Um, I, I, other than that, I, I think th- they they did a good job recognizing they needed to move the patient, mm-hmm. recognizing they the treatments that they needed to start and starting those things. I think they made a good call in requesting police to come to the hospital versus trying to get more people there. Um, I did have uh, one of my uh, one of our 
uh, co-reviewers uh, for the podcast who likes to remain anonymous. So um, <laughs> fine, you're anonymous. Um, they made a really good point that I want to bring up now, which is if you are requesting help to the scene, you probably need to meet them to give them like, hey, heads up, this is there, there's some shit going down in here before you go into the scene, before they go into the scene, because otherwise they might go, what kind of holy abuse is happening here? Yeah. And, you know, right in front um, of the daughter. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's one where if you are in a situation, if you do need lifting help or some other help to respond, it have a reason to maybe give them a little mm-hmm. heads up before they walk into the scene. Um, but yeah. um, I, I again, that not a situation here, but it was just one of those things that I thought was worth bringing up. So um, I, I, I don't know. I think those are really like all the clinical parts that I saw. And I think we should review those first because they are small. And the, yeah. the bulk of this, like you guys said, is mm-hmm. OK, let's talk about elder <laughs> abuse and yeah. maybe just abuse in general and mm-hmm. the operations uh, aspects of it and the patient aspects I and the one legal. remaining clinical point. All right. Hit me. Sorry. I walked right over there. Um, One remaining clinical point. It's only because I don't respect you, Spencer. Don't take it. No, no, that's fine. Um, (laughs) uh, They already checked a blood pressure or a blood sugar. Blood sugar. Yeah. It was even that was hard for you to even say. It's just uh, so foreign to me. Yeah. Um, So (laughs) the only one remaining clinical point I want to make is I know we probably have some people listening. It's like, hey, like we have this blood pressure of 140 over 90. How do we explain the poor peripheral perfusion? Like, you know, why? You know, if we oh, had that blood pressure, why don't we have SATs? Why why can't we get a radial? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and uh, I, I I I understand that that question, but um, I think it's one of the things where, uh, on one hand, you know, there's always probably some people think it's like, did this person just not get an accurate blood pressure? Did they just you know mess it up somehow? And here's the thing. Always a possibility, right? We yeah, can yeah, always yeah. make these mistakes. We're good at them. Um, but you got to remember, patients are strange. And while we think about things in terms of sepsis, and one of the biggest issues with sepsis is you, actually, is you get that uh, those leaky blood vessels, you know, where uh, they they tend to want to dilate, you know, and we uh, and, and one of the and you start thinking like, gosh, like, well, if, if those blood vessels are are dilating, like, shouldn't we be getting in a blood pressure like that? Shouldn't we be getting a pulse all the way to the fingers? Sure, but then you got to remember. People are just different. And I, I, Nick, I'm sure you've had the same space. I'm sure you had the same. You have patients who's like, oh, yeah, they're definitely septic. They definitely have all these things. And then you have a vital sign that just is, is there. It's as accurate as you can get it. It just doesn't fit. Yeah, it's not a whack. That's just yeah. patients. And so what it could be is that this patient, for whatever reason, uh, they are not uh, – they're, they're not getting that, that vasodilation that most sepsis patients uh, would get. Mm-hmm. Instead, what is happening is their body saying, I need to – conserve every ounce of fluid I have to keep it in the right spot. And I'm going to clamp down all the extremities Mm -hmm. uh, and and the fingers. And so you'll actually see this with norepi administration. I know Spencer and I see this frequently in flight because I feel like norepi is kind of like the uh, the Zofran of the uh, of the critical care flight world. Uh, and since it seems like everyone's getting it, um, mm-hmm. but uh, you'll see patients where the pulse oximeter won't work and they have these blue fingers, but they have an otherwise normal blood pressure, usually with a higher diastolic. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's simply because the vasculature is clamped down. So while you're not getting anything out the the fingertips, Blood pressure elsewhere in the body is otherwise fine because everything's shunted to the center. Um, so that's one possible reason. We don't have enough knowledge on this patient to know why the vital signs are what they are. But sometimes you just run into patients in this field where they're just like, yeah, nah, I'm going to do it this way. And you're like, OK, human body. Yeah. OK. <laughs> and uh, I know we're up to a kind of a time constraint, um, but I do want to say for our listeners, if you can tell us why you think the patient's potassium uh, for the or the peaked T waves might have been present. Uh, let us know in our comments. Hint, uh, it may I, have something to do with potassium. <laughs> maybe I don't know, um, and why that is. Uh, so let's it, let's get to the uh, let's get to the the fun stuff. Let's get to the legalese. Uh, wow. Yeah. Where, yeah. where do you all want to start? There was so much. Yeah. Well. Well. I th- well let's start with the obvious part. Uh, First responders, EMTs, paramedics, you are mandated reporters. Okay. Which means that when you encounter a scene like this, you are obligated to report it to law enforcement. And so this is for elder abuse and child abuse. You're obligated to report this. 
the manner in which that's done, it, it depends, right? So do you, <laughs> do you do it right here on the scene, yeah. which you could, or do you do what this crew did and request them to come to the hospital? Either way, it's okay. fine. As long as that report is made. Is there a time limit? Yes. Yes. Um, yes. And as soon as possible. Okay. Really. I think specifically um, in Georgia, you have 24 hours to report. Yeah, I think okay. that's right. Gotcha. And if you don't report it, at least in Georgia, it's it's a misdemeanor. Oh, wow. So mm. if they find out that you were on the scene and you didn't report it, you can be in trouble for that. Yeah. Well, so, that makes sense. And, and to yeah. the point of clarification, I just wanted to add, and, and at least in Georgia, so it depends on your state, and I encourage EMTs and paramedics, anybody who has the potential to run a call like this, know the law in your state. Because specifically in Georgia, it's not good enough for you to pa just pass that information onto the hospital. And it's not good enough in Georgia to just pass that information over to law enforcement. In Georgia, you also have to notify Adult Protective Services. And if you don't do all those things, um, uh, that's that can it is a misdemeanor. So yeah, yeah that is correct. Um, so you want to make sure that gets done. So who qualifies as a child and who qualifies as an elder? Oh, that depends. Yeah, that depends. <laughs> it depends on your state law. Okay. Um, but here's the thing about mandated reporting. You can make those reports without fear of any liability. So if you think it doesn't sure, look depends. right, yeah. you report it. And sense. either, you know, child protective services, adult protective services, law enforcement, they'll sort it out after the fact. Okay. But it's like the if you see say something, say something. Gotcha. And so that's why we tell people just go ahead and report and you know make it where you're um you're doing your duty and then worry about what happens later on. Gotcha. So be better yeah. better to to err on the side of well, this could be a child mm -hmm. or could be elder. Yes. And then let someone else figure it out. Yes, yeah. always. I yeah. like that. Someone else can figure it out. That's perfect. <laughs> now, my understanding is that typically um, we are, uh, and it turns out that there is some uh, variety in uh, how uh, elder abuse uh, in terms of EMS involvement uh, gets defined. Uh, some protocols don't actually have anything in it. It's just you're, you know, you're, you're they hope you know. You know, it's mm -hmm. it's like what what is obscene? Well, you know it when you see it, right? Yeah, um, yeah. right. Um, but uh, the fear is that in some in those situations, because there are so many different types of abuse. Um, for instance, the National Institute on Aging, which is a U.S. government site, says, "Hey, there's physical abuse, emotional mm -hmm. abuse, neglect, financial, uh, yeah. uh, financial. Yep, that was a big mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. uh, abandonment and sexual. Um, th those are all you know present." Uh, a lot of EMS protocols focus on if they do focus on it or talk about it, they talk about the physical aspects, mm -hmm. um, but they don't really talk about any of the others. Um, Sam, I guess my question is because, you know, EMS is more likely to encounter these patients because they're often more fragile mm -hmm. to be in this yes. sort of vulnerable position. Um, what about you know, like, it, where, I guess, where is the, where is the line of for people who are like, Oh, what if I, you know, like, I don't want a misdemeanor. Um, where, what is the line, I guess, in terms of, hey, what qualifies <laughs> as these types of abuse? Um, is there, you know, like if I show up and, you know, like somebody's saying something chastising to the patient, um, you know, like, would I get in trouble if I didn't report like, hey, mm -hmm. that looked like, you know, emotional abuse? Um, Good question. Yeah, I mean... If it seems off in any way, yeah, err on the side of reporting. Because again, there's no liability for you doing it. Okay. So it makes more sense to just go ahead and say it and let someone else sort it out after the fact. Gotcha. Yeah. Uh, question for you, and, Samantha. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Spence. Sorry. Oh, and I guess the, the reason I'm asking this because like it's not really our job to determine 
that abuse is present. Like when I call somebody, I'm not like, hey, this person is definitely getting abused. Yeah, what we're are. saying is, hey, I saw some warning signs. Yes. So yes. I'm not saying, hey, that this is abuse, like clear. You know, there's a clear and present danger. Um, <laughs> so what yeah. I'm what I'm saying is, hey, this is something that should be looked into more because there are there were there were red flags. Yes. Yes. OK. Yeah, I think that's well, a great you, way to look at that. You open a door to an interesting piece of this because then the question is always, how do I do my PCR? What do I say yeah. in my PCR? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And you have to just report the facts. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a longer PCR, definitely. You're going to spend some more time on it because you can guarantee that if it is an abuse case, this is going to court. Mm-hmm. And right. your chart is going to be an issue. So taking the time to go through and describe everything that you see on the scene, that's the right way to do it. Gotcha. But you have to be careful about putting opinion in there. Gotcha. Right. So in this particular case, you know, I would say your PCR should include things like there was brown fuzzy mold growing on the mattress. Yeah. Um, that's a fact. That's not an opinion. You can put that in there. Um, but you shouldn't put things like, the daughter's story sounded entirely implausible to me. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. You know, and I, I thought she was lying. Gotcha. You know, yeah. you can report like, I asked the daughter, you know, when was the last time the patient was turned? Mm-hmm. And she reported that it was, you know, every two hours. Gotcha. However, <laughs> when we went to move the patient, we found that the patient was fused to the vine. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Okay. Yeah. And if you're going to put jokes in there, you got to make sure they're really funny. Because if oh, they're, yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> yeah. otherwise, what if, what if we put it in quotes because my partner said it to me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Like, this, oh, this this person is full of shit. Harder reports. Harder reports. Well, and you have to be careful about how you describe emotions of people too, right? Yeah. So if you said the daughter was angry at us, you know, mm-hmm. and leave it at that, that doesn't really tell you anything. When you say the daughter came at us with a baseball bat and said, get the F out of my house. Yeah. That's and a little more descriptive. And said, quote, get the fuck out of my house. Yeah. That's a different way of reporting. Because that's a fact, right? Yeah. He came at you with the baseball bat. Yeah. 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 I I guess I would fall into the trap because uh, I like to highlight for myself later in reports when mm-hmm. findings, um, you know, the information I'm being told doesn't seem consistent with the evidence that I have. Mm-hmm. I usually like I, I have historically made notes like, you know, um, you know, the, the you know, so and so is a poor historian. Um, you know, it, this, you know, this seems inconsistent with, you know, the, the assessment or, you know, whatever, um, is, is that sort of, uh, what I'm hearing is that might be a dangerous way to chart, um, that versus just giving the details and sort of having, um, future me or whoever's reading it come to that conclusion on their own based on those Mm -hmm. findings. Yeah, I think you have to let someone else come to that conclusion. Usually a jury in these kind of cases. Um, You just lay out the facts and let them think what they will about it. Okay. So um, if if nobody minds, I have another question for, uh, for Sam and Nick here. And and this might not, so Sam. I, I mean, I know you're, you're now. You're you're not a prosecutor, right? I mean, that's not. I am not. I don't gotcha. have any of that in my background. Okay. She's a good lawyer. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, no, that's 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 good. But I work with them a lot. Um. So I guess. Um. So so for for you guys, uh, what charges specific charges? Uh, do you see? I mean, and obviously, like this is just an opinion. You guys weren't there. All the disclaimers uh, in the world, but what are the potential charges you see the defendant, the very aptly named character in this, the defendant facing in this? So for me, you know, there's obviously charges for elder abuse specifically. Um, Depending on how bad the abuse is, Mm -hmm. 
is really the question of whether it's a misdemeanor or a felony. Gotcha. Um, this one leans a little more toward the felony side to me. Gotcha. This is the put them under the jail kind yeah. of case. Do and we know? So, yeah. Do, do we know it? The, the, yeah, Spence, do we know? I mean, we, we know that they were prosecuted. I, I don't have but... the, I know they were prosecuted. I don't know the, uh, what, what the outcome. Gotcha. Um, so so uh so question for you then so what are the, what would the differences between um a misdemeanor uh elder abuse and a felony elder abuse like, like what what are the, the the differences there it's it's really the degree gotcha. of it like how bad was this person injured gotcha and and maybe like what would like over time play a factor like it was ongoing for two weeks as opposed to a single event does that really play a factor or, it can absolutely gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and then just to play devil's advocates, what kind of defenses could you see? Like if you had to defend this person, what kind of things oh, wow. would you be looking for if you had to defend them? That's a cool question. Um, I would be <laughs> defense looking state, at go. ignorance. <laughs> ignorance. Yeah. I would be, Sorry, I, you know, I, I, asking I, I for the mercy said. of, like I was trying to take care of my dad. Gotcha. And I have no other support. I'm not trained as a healthcare worker, you know. And then I would counsel my client to take a plea. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, yeah, it's kind of what it sounds like it would need to happen. I mean, it's pretty. Yeah. I think the other yeah. thing, too, I mean, well, she said she was the only one that had access to the patient for a while. So we know that it was just her. And I guess my and sorry, Spencer, you've been trying to chomp at a question for a bit. I keep cutting you off. I'm used to it. Go yeah, ahead. Because again, I don't <laughs> respect fine. it. I, no, I'm just yeah. That sounds yeah, awful. Actually, fine. I have a ton of respect for Spencer, just so everybody knows. Um, he He's just saying that. I just he don't just like showing it. Uh, <laughs> only because he has a few fans on this show if he didn't. Uh, anyway, that's all horrible stuff. Um, so I, uh, the other question I would have then is, um, does oh, – I hope I'm using this terms right. Does – because I want to seem fancy in the one lawyer term, I know that maybe most people don't. But is there a mens rea requirement when it comes oh, to uh, nice. abuse? In other words, yeah. does she have to intend to abuse this patient? And does intention change the outcome of this, like in terms of what she could get uh, when she if she's found guilty? Somebody did their homework. Yes, mm. that will go to the degree gotcha. of okay. what happens. So you have intentional you have grossly negligent, you know, you have like willfully negligent, that sort of thing. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. It's all the same things that we've talked about, like in other cases, you have a level of how bad you were. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, uh, so and things... obviously the intentional, you yeah. know, ratchets it up. Oh, I bet. Yeah. Yeah. And and I think I, I think that was something that got brought up early by Nick, which is, you know, like in, in, we go on this where we have people, you know, people who are unqualified yeah. to really be caring for somebody who end up being the sole provider and they, you know, they don't have the support they need mm -hmm. here. Uh, we have somebody who essentially like they it didn't seem like they didn't know what to do because their answers seemed like their, they, their answers they, were lies yeah, and they that they, yeah yeah and so uh is that something worth documenting again like when you're if you're you know if you're like hey i i definitely want to help the police with this report later is that or is that something you just kind of report to the police uh and you leave out of your pcr Ooh. Um, i would leave it out of the pcr but okay. you can certainly say that to the police in your statement. Like, yeah. I didn't feel that was believable, and here's why. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. But I would leave it out of the PCR. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, well, yeah, I, I guess. There's um, one more thing I want to touch on before we go. Um, yeah. yeah. And we, we made the note earlier. So as we're walking out the door, we got the patient on the stretcher. The daughter says, hey, I want you to fully resuscitate this patient uh, right. if code on the way to the hospital. So I thought the great question there was, it, can she do that? Yeah, that's a really so good question. It depends, it depends on what your state law says. <laughs> because some state laws allow family members to override existing DNRs. Mm -hmm. Now, he didn't have one, so that's 
less of an issue. But there's also the, whenever people say do everything, there's still a limited amount of clinical interventions right. that you can actually do or that are medically appropriate. Right. And I always tell my folks and my physicians in particular in the hospital, it's you, it's not the standard of care to do things that are medically inappropriate. Sure. So if a patient comes in and said, or a family member comes in and says, I want you to cut my dad's leg off. Right. And there's no reason for you to do it. You, you don't do it. Yeah. So you, it's always appropriate to do what's medically appropriate and medically necessary for the patient. And that do everything, just you can ignore that. Yeah. Gotcha. And, and likewise, if they were like, no, 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 definitely DNR. Um, I don't want them to be a witness um yeah. i take that with a grain of salt in this situation too and that would be one where you contact medical control maybe and and say hey is that what you want us to do um yeah. because the family who is poa is saying one thing but we're but are we're they worried. poa though yeah yeah no, well that's and fair. that's you can't always know when you're on scene, yeah, you can only do the best you can with what you have. Mm -hmm. So, I feel like I'd be it's... reasonably comfortable given everything that we've seen in this in, in this thing and being like, "Hey, they requested we not resuscitate, but everything they had said did not match up, and I mm -hmm. didn't feel comfortable mm -hmm. taking this person at their word for it." Yeah, yeah. I, I I would feel, but but again, I mean, I I know that as much as we want law to be black and white and to have you know bulletproof defenses on stuff. It really boils down to what who's going to make what argument, you know, and, and how well they could make it and those kind of things. So, yeah. but I, yeah, I think I would I would feel comfortable uh, doing uh, doing doing that. So uh, yeah. can I let me add one more thing absolutely. before you go into the clinical part. So damages went back in and took a picture of the oh. scene. Yeah. Oh, yes. yeah, 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 yeah. On yeah, there, yeah. On their personal cell phone. Yeah. Yes. Well, we can assume. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So that cell phone is now evidence. Yes. Oh, boy. Um, be careful taking things on your personal phones if you don't want law enforcement to confiscate it. And we all know that EMS people have things on their phone that they don't want other people to see. What? Um, that, <laughs> Just being EMS said, people. <laughs> that being said, there are some scenes that are literally so unbelievable yeah. that yeah. you just have to. Yeah. And, and I wouldn't necessarily fault them for doing that. Like, they didn't actually take a picture of the patient. They took a picture of the scene. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, I, would, I wouldn't put it on Snapchat. Oh, but, okay. Yeah. But, you know, like... Fine. Showing that to law enforcement, that's, uh, you know, yeah. I can see yeah. why you would do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. I mean, I think we kind of covered most of the clinical stuff uh, earlier. So, I mean, really, unless. Go really, uh, the, the only thing I want to bring up, and, and this is just um, kind of a, a quick for, you know, for the uh, you know, as a reminder, um, per the National Institute on Aging, about one in 10 adults uh, over the age of 60 are suspected of uh, undergoing elder mm -hmm. abuse. Oh, um, and one of those various one of those various times. Um, I looked at another statistic for children and uh, the closest I got was one in seven. Mm. Um, oh. But uh, we, we, we are often for elders. We are often the people who go on them because again, they are like fragile. Um, and so uh, there's sort of a, there's a missed opportunity um, uh, to, I guess, recognize these situations and to report them. So, one of the things that I think we should keep in mind as we go on to any type of suspected abuse situation is one scene safety. Um, you know, if we go on a, a scene and there is an abuser there um, and uh, we say the wrong thing, we do the wrong thing. There is a, there is a, I think a potential for the scene to go sideways. Um, you know, um, if somebody, you know, they're like, Oh, it turns out uh, they, figured out that we are 
you know, that, that we know they abuse their child, um, they, that might hit their, uh, well, fuck it switch. And, uh, yeah. they might do something awful. Um, or, you know, um, yeah, awful. They, uh, um, yeah. we have, the, yeah, uh, we do also need to keep in mind that some of this is going to be evidence prevention. Um, so, you know, obviously in this situation, the vinyl sheet is, I guess, technically evidence, evidence prevention or preservation. Preservation. Gotcha. Yeah, first of all, yeah, I always evidence, try to prevent no, evidence. I, I always destroy Burn the that evidence. vinyl sheet. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, you know, like if we're there's a recommendation, basically, like, hey, if there's a stain, if there's, you know, like if there's clothing that needs to be oh. protect, like covered for the law enforcement aspect of it, uh, try not to destroy it if you don't have to. Um, the assessment wise. You know, uh, obviously, we need to identify life threats. Uh, the other part of this assessment is to avoid confrontation, because if we are confronting somebody on scene uh, who is a potential abuser, um, that very, very, very drastically can complicate the situation. Um, and we also and this is really, really important. It, we have to understand that there is a complex dynamic in abusive situations that we will not appreciate you like. We I think we think with our logic brains that the person who is being abused should hate the person that and not want to be protective of the person that is abusing. But that that isn't the dynamic that's at play. This, these are incredibly complex relationships. Very true. And so recognizing that that person, even though they have been you know horribly, horribly abused, they will probably still there's a strong chance that they will still do everything they can to protect that person, which brings the next point, which is that we really, really, really have to be careful with questions and how we uh, interview our patients. Um, we do not want to it cast any blame on either side the best we can we want to ask the least invasive questions we can um we want to avoid questions that even sound like they could be blaming like well what were you wearing at the time this happened or okay well how much did you have to drink um and you know and all and also avoiding like the that person is a monster like fuck that guy um i hope they die because the person probably doesn't want that you know especially if it's yeah. Especially if it's a child, you yeah. know, and that's a, yeah. a loved figure. Yeah. Um, and uh, for the piece of especially with um, and, I, and I got this bit off of a uh, uh, the general approach in management of the patient who discloses a sexual assault piece. Um, but this is a really important aspect that I did not get uh, a high degree of training of. So I'm I'm hoping that this mm -hmm. helps questions regarding the forensic history should be asked least evasive to most invasive and the and understand that the retelling of events may cause re-traumatization mm -hmm. so whenever mm -hmm. possible her forensic history should be obtained with advocacy and law enforcement to minimize the number of times that the patient has to disclose the event mm -hmm. so yes. this is one of those situations where in an ambulance if you are responding to uh, you know somebody who has undergone a sexual assault um, you, you don't need to know all the details. In mm -hmm. fact, it's it, sure. like be open to hearing details and, you know, to questions to patient care that pertain to patient care, um, be, you know, cognizant of that. Um, but don't do not pry, um, especially because then details could change and it could really complicate the situation yeah. because we know yes. memory is not a recording device. It is a book that gets rewritten every time the story is accessed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, uh, those are, I think those are really the, the big pieces for, um, for that, uh, for the like general suspected abuse assessment. Um, I think the big takeaways are if you see something, um, you uh, you should call to follow up just to report the red flags, because, again, this is one in 10 people uh, that we go on and, you know, that mm -hmm. potentially could be suffering and um, do it as soon and, as possible. Uh, yeah. Yes. And uh, don't document that uh, the person was full of shit. Unlike I uh, <laughs> unlike I like to do so unless you can say it in a humorous or funny way. Yeah. <laughs> then it's okay. That's key takeaway. Yeah. According to Samantha Johnson, lawyer, 
That yeah. is what. You can call your lawyer. That is modified legal. That in a privileged <laughs> conversation, not in your chart. Oh man! I hope everyone knows we're joking. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, when yeah, my pop do that? listens to this. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, well, guys, thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, – we've been trying to get this one in the works for a while, but it turns out we are all <laughs> very, that. very busy. Um, but we're always excited to have you guys on. I do hope we get to do it again in the future. For everybody listening, please go check out the Standard of Pair uh, – sta- Jesus. <laughs> standard of Pair. That's our next wow. one. Standard of Pair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, which we could be talking fruit. We could be talking a pair of people. <laughs> this yeah. is a standard pair. This is a anyway. Go check out the Standard of Care podcast uh, to learn uh, all the things you probably talk about all the time anyway. Because I feel like ninety seven percent of all ambulance conversations are like legal things of like, well, if you put it quotes mm-hmm. in your chart, it's totally fine. Uh, so go check out the Standard of Care podcast. Uh, listen to them habitually. It's you'll you will thank me later. Uh, if you want your call to be on this show, go check out our social media. It's EMS 20 slash 20 on Facebook and at EMS 2020 show on Instagram. There's a biggest page in the description on the Instagram. There's a pinned post on the Facebook and there you will find a link to a form that will help you get your call submitted. And uh, gosh, with that, We'll see you guys in a couple Wednesdays. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Uh, Thanks, Nick. Thank you. Bye. Bye. EMS 2020 is a Long Pause Media LLC production. Episodes are based on submitted calls. This episode was written by Spencer Oliver, reviewed by Contu Curio, audio editing by Chris Finkston.